Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to our bi-weekly, every two weeks, every other Thursday call for the community where we try to answer all your questions subject to the disclaimers that you heard when you were logging into the conference. Today is September 15th, 2022. I'll first go over the questions that I have marked as frequently asked questions. Once I have done those, then I'll be dealing with the questions that have been posted. And if time remains, we'll deal with new questions. The first frequently asked question that I noted down is a continuation of a previously asked question. So this has happened a lot in this fiscal year that went by and just finished on September 30th. What has happened is, let's say you were working for employer number one. You got your EB2 approval through employer number one. You've got your I-140 approved, but you changed employers and you went to employer number two. At employer number two, you filed your labor cert under EB3 or you downgraded to EB3. Essentially, you had no EB2 approval through employer number two. So you have a situation where you have EB2 approved through an old employer for whom you no longer work and EB3 with a new employer through whom you also filed a 485 because there was a little blip during which the priority dates become current. Now, technically, you can only get an EB3 approval. Why? Because your current employer is an EB3 holding employer. EB2 employer is in the past. What has happened is a lot of people have actually received approvals. And I was just thinking about this. Uh, to me, it seems almost like the USCIS tried to do a whitewash and try to approve as many green cards as possible, even if those green cards were approved in error. So they cannot approve your green card under EB2 for the employer for whom you no longer work while you are on EB3 with the employer whom, for whom you do work and through whom you had filed the 485. So last time we had a discussion about this last, last week. Oh, by the way, I forgot to ask you guys. Um, the conference is now in conversation mode. Oh, can you all hear me okay, guys? Am I audible? Yes. Yeah. Uh, okay. Yes, yes. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. The conference is now in presentation mode. So one of the questions raised was, now I've got my, uh, my green card approval. And you, Rajiv, are saying this is a mistake and you don't, don't depend upon it, what should I do? And then I had told people, you know what, contact your congressman's office, tell them what's going on, because there is nothing in law that allows the government to really provide you that approval, because you're no longer working for that employer, the past employer, and this is not an AC-21 situation where you had already filed a 485. So I don't see how they can approve this green card. Now, there are some follow-up questions on this, okay? So now that the green card is incorrect, questions. So remember I told uh, uh, this member of our community, who is it? Oh, Rahul ji. Oh, Rahul ji is an old acquaintance of mine. He's been logging into our conference calls for years. So Rahul ji says, he's got his approval, Suppose the congressman's written response, response from USCIS comes back affirmative, right? And there are other people, many other people who've got similar approvals. You know, that's what bothers me, Rahulji. I think USCIS is trying to just, just do a whitewash, okay? They are just trying to uh, sweep it under the rug, approve as many green cards as, as they can. That way on the books, they look good they utilize the maximum number of green cards. So if in the following fiscal year, we lose those green cards, their face is still painted white, right? That's what it looks like to me. And it's not unique, I know. Our, some of our own clients have that same issue. 
you should still pursue the e-request, I think. Um, but no, no, hang on. Let me rephrase that. This is up to you now. Because if you have received from the congressman information that USCIS says, oh, no, this is no problem, you could take that to be the end of the story. Or if you wanted to be even more sure, which is what I would do, I would still submit the e-request with an I-90 saying this green card appears to have been approved in error. I don't like to take chances. Now, can you use it for travel? This is a tougher question. I think you could, especially if you already had an advanced parole approved. So if you approve my green card in error and you overrule my advanced parole, then you can't come back tomorrow and say, well, you traveled without authorization. I was authorized. Either I had my green, my green card or I had my advanced parole. So my advice on travel would be avoid it if you can. But if you have to, I think you can argue quite successfully that that travel was valid and it does not affect your pending green card. So if you if you use this card for any of the above purposes and USCIS comes back negative, do you lose your status? Well, uh, I don't think so because you have an EAD, right? An advanced parole. If they approved in error, I would say then put me back retroactively, what they call nunk pro tunk, into that status that you overruled, right? You approved my green card and you screwed up my advanced parole and EAD. That's your problem, dude. It's not my problem. So I think you've got a pretty strong argument there. I Definitely you can continue using your EAD, but don't use your, your AP if you can avoid it. I'm just concerned because I get paid to be paranoid. That's the way I look at it. I hope that clarifies things. Anybody has any follow-up question on this, guys? Press star five. Any follow-up questions on this? Press star five, okay? I have one from area code 608. Uh, 608, go ahead, please. I can hear you. Namaste, Rajiv Ji. I'm Rahul. Hi, Rahul. How are you? I guess I have one. Well, so what first quick question is, uh, is this FAQ, because I tried to search for this FAQ, are you still writing it? Or, because I couldn't find it. I searched for different ways on your website, this FAQ. Or are you still in the process of posting it? Because you I know, couldn't find um, it. You know, do, do me a favor, just send an email to Deepa. In the FAQ. Yeah, just send an email to Deepa, D-E-E-P-A, Deepa at immigration.com. Uh, uh -huh. She does, uh, she's the main editorial person in our team. Just say, Deepa, um, Rajiv asked me to okay. check with you. Have we been posting our frequently asked questions from our um, conference calls? Because we had a sure. conference call last week. I think she's doing it. And we are also sending them to the Economic Times. That's what I thought. Yeah. No, we are doing both. I okay. think we are doing both. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Then my next question is, I'm still waiting on the congressman's response because they have a 30 day cycle after which they check back again the 30 days haven't you know it's still within the 30 day response time so right. obviously my congressman will continue i mean i uh so i believe till then i'm just i mean i have i mean before taking any next step i just wait to see what the congressman comes yeah. back with yeah so, because yeah. I think USCIS has to offer them something, you see. Uh, that's what I see. The other, uh, there is other other angle that I just wanted to confirm with you. In the AC21 case, uh, for my readings on the law uh, that I did after this whole mess was the 485J, there is not really a statutory and mandatory requirement to file it unless USCIS act asks for it either through RFE or NOID. And there is also not any specified time within which it should be filed. Is that, are these two statements correct? I believe they are correct. There is definitely no time limit unless the USCIS questions it. I think there are only two circumstances. Actually, if you go to my blog, I have, when the law first came out, I drew a mind map. The, I drew a mind uh -huh. map to show when it is required, when it is not required. So uh, I have to move on, okay. Rahulji. But, but I have to move on to the next call. Okay. What you need to do is keep following up with your congressman 
कंटिन्यू टू वर्क दैर इज नो प्रॉब्लम विद योर वर्क हाँ ट्रेवलिंग जस्ट अवॉइड दैट अंटिल वी गेट दिस ट्रेट एंड आउट ओके गुड लक planning on traveling next year yeah. but hope this gets straightened out until next year actually. yeah we can we can certainly hope that okay good luck thank you you welcome you. uh area code 248 i can hear you but no new questions only follow ups right now i'm just doing follow up to this question did you have a follow up question area code no, 248 sorry. yeah no problem no, i mean no I problem wait till the end one. wait till the end okay thank you okay then um the next frequently asked question is um what i'll do is guys i'll lock the conference in about uh, 15 20 minutes and then i'll make sure that everybody who who's here their questions get answered so we started at um, 12:30 exact at 1 o'clock i lock the conference and then i'll make sure that everybody who's here their questions get answered uh then next was this is also a very commonly encountered problem so let's say my green card is pending i've got my 485 advance parole i'm outside the united states and my green card gets approved so what do i do now do i do i come back on my advance parole and the answer is yes you come back on your advance parole when you come at the airport in the united states they should admit you either on advance parole or they should admit you as a green card holder both are okay in my opinion when once you have entered you are still a green card holder i don't see any reason to think that's not so if you want to confirm it you can always Uh, contact your congressman's office and have them confirm with the customs and border protection which is always a good idea but in my opinion you are a green card holder this situation is not covered by the regulations and in fact when you enter on the advance parole with the green card already approved cbp has in most cases entered you as a green card holder so let's see what this question was here yeah they in this case what happened was for for community member cpn they brought him in on advance parole so another thing you can do is i just had another idea you can contact the customs and border protection and go to one of their offices okay usually they are at the airport go to their office and um, ask them i think they are called deferred inspection office deferred inspection and ask them why they have they not let you in as a green card holder which is what they should be doing they might be able to change your um your i94 or your entrance or your entrance particular what is uh, technically called admission they'll change your admission to a green card holder okay i think you are perfectly okay but i would like you to double check it first with the cbp and then with the congressman okay any follow up questions on this press star 5 any follow up questions press star 5 okay so today i'm going to make sure i'm going to do things a little differently i think that's what we should do anybody who's here in the first half hour will make sure their questions get answered other people i'll just lock out okay i think there were only two frequently asked questions this time around let me double check yes so now let's go to the very beginning and start on the normal questions that we had by the way if anybody is waiting here for dv lottery answers we don't do dv lotteries so i don't know anything about them please hang up i will not be answering any questions about dv lottery okay sorry about that so the first question from is from parth which is marked as question number 2 can i drive uh, for an, for uber while on f1 or h1b in my opinion no any follow up questions on this press star 5 any follow up questions okay question number 2 uh, 2 is uh, number mark number 3 is from mr paul om prakash paul filed for a change of status from h1b to h4 on in may okay ask for starting date in february i think you can't do that think about it from what i remember of the regulations you can only ask 6 months ahead of time 
So if you go to go six months from May, it should be November. You can't go to February. I don't think the government should approve it. But I don't know how they approved it. They gave you two approval notices uh, for H4. One was dated August 23 beginning and the other one was, uh, no, one was dated, yeah, August 23rd. The other one was February 1st. I don't think they can give, give you February 1st. I think they have made an error, sir. So you should open a service ticket with the government and say, what the hell are you doing? Which one should I be using? I think they can take you as much as November, but they can't take you beyond November. So talk with them, see what they say. Okay, open a service ticket. Star five, if you have a follow-up question on this. Star five, okay. This is from area code 248. 248, 248, where is 248 located? Michigan. Okay. So, uh, Michigan, go ahead, please. Uh, yeah, so Rajiji, I'm Omprakash Pal. You are answering my question only. Ji, sir. So, basically, yeah, I mean, uh, my my employers, I mean, my wife employer, uh, they didn't raise any question, I mean, question like when I requested it with FAFAS and they have submitted the application. And even I today I called USIS also to confirm that and they said, the latest notice is the correct one. So okay. Means okay. The starting date. Perhaps. Okay. If they have already yeah. told you that, yeah. if they have already told you that, yeah. what you should do is write down the date and the time of the call that you had with the USCIS and write, write down what they told you. Okay. Okay. Now, I am surprised sure. because general understanding is that they can only approve six months ahead. But you know, um, USCIS does have uh, a lot. Of, yeah, go yeah, ahead. That, go ahead. That is for I think H1, but uh, this was a separate H4 application because my wife's H1 was approved long back. So, and uh, the attorney said you can request in 12 months in advance also for H4. So that's fine. And uh, even that's why the EAD card, right? They they valid, put the valid, same validity, even though there is no requested start yeah. for EAD application. I wasn't sure so about that. Yeah, I wasn't. It's not in the regulations. Okay. The regulations are silent on it. So if they have given it to you and then they have confirmed it, I would be I would be okay with that then. Yeah, yeah. So and the other question was like, uh, because there are two approval notices and definitely the latest one, I think they have corrected them, whatever mistakes they made one day before. So, but but, but Om Prakash Ji, uh, you already... I said, you already confirmed with them, right? They told you, yeah, yeah, use the second notice, right? Yes. And I think you are I fine. wanted a, a second opinion from you. That yeah, I was con concerned because I, I would have... Wanted a yeah, I wanted you to double check with the USCIS. Now, for H-1B, it is in the regulations. You can't ask for anything more than six months ahead of time. And normally, we have assumed that the right, same, right. same um, policy would apply to H-4. But if they are more lenient with the H4s, it is definitely not documented. If they are giving it to you, by all means, take it. And, and they have also confirmed it. I think you are safe. And, and Yeah. I mean, another reason is like there is no start date on H4 EAD application and they have given that date on H4 EAD. That means H4 also starts on the same date. <laughs> That's what yeah. I assume. And I check E-Verify also. It says I am employment authorized. So that means either I am on H4 H1B right now. Otherwise, you verify never say, right? You are yeah. employment appraised if I am only on H4 without EAD. Yes, if you don't have an EAD, they should not consider you employment verified. That is correct. But you know, with government systems, it is always better yeah, to just double work. check. And you have double checked. You've done your homework. I think you've done yeah. the best you can. Good luck. All right. Thank uh, you very much for confirming that. You're Thank welcome, you sir. Much. You're welcome. Really appreciate your help. My pleasure. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye-bye. Okay. Let's go on to the next question. And this one is um, from, this is question number four. Filing for I-485 application based upon recent approval of EB1A I-140. Can changes be made to DS-160? So here the issue was 
there was some period about 60 days during which um, this member of our community was out of status 60 days now I don't think this is a problem but your what you have written down is a little confusing to me you said you went for biometrics I'm assuming you are outside USA okay and if you are outside USA and you filed your DS-160 you are concerned the best thing to do is write an email to the immigrant visa section of the US consulate explain to them that you are concerned about this uh, in my opinion this is not a big deal but you should still document it that you try to correct it and just say that I marked yes and I have explained I just want to make sure that the records have been properly updated okay so I think that email will help you keep a copy of that email uh, and it goes to the immigrant visa section okay star 5 if you have a follow-up question on this press star 5 this is from Indianapolis okay Indiana go ahead I can hear you please hi Raji thank you for answering my question so sure. yes I was I, I went outside of the United States there was a gap right. between you know my finding the new job uh, and the time until the file for my x one so I was outside of the uh, US this happened in do around the Delhi consulate so oh, one, one, uh, one, one question one question one question uh, are you mm -hmm. currently applying for 485 or are you going through consular processing for green card no I'm doing 485 you are doing for oh okay now I understand because this was a little confusing the timeline yeah. was a little confusing yeah. so what happened was during a non-immigrant yeah. visa application you change your DS-160 correct mm -hmm. okay and there yes. where it says have you been out of status you said yes right mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and that's the correct thing yeah. to say that is the right thing to say yeah so, yeah yeah, yeah. The, so the question was this you know I had to change it at the very last minute you know I had to do yeah. a small name uh, correction so since I did it in a, in a hurry I was not able to save my DS-160 do me and do I'm me a little bit paranoid yeah, do, I do me it. I think this is what I would have you do have you submitted your 485 already mm -hmm. no no I have not okay have, not. have your lawyers write a cover letter pointing this out mm -hmm. I don't think you're going to have any okay. problem okay. you might have a little bit of delay they might need to look at the consulate files but I think that is the smart thing to mm -hmm. do come forward let them know uh, so I, I don't think it's I, any mm -hmm. issue at all mm -hmm. Just one follow-up question. I'm not going to take a lot of your time. Mm -hmm. Is there, I mean, would it be make sense for me to file a FOIA to get a DS-160 because I could not find the correct answer for that online? Yeah, so why not? Is it possible to file a FOIA? At the why, why not? I don't see. Yeah, I don't see why any, not. Is there any risk? No risk. Is there any risk? No, no, that? no. I mean, let's ask. Okay, okay. No risk okay. at all. Go for it. And, I don't see uh, why not. And. Uh, on an average, do you know how much time it takes to several to a, uh, several uh, months? Before, yeah. Several months. Oh, I several months. Yeah, I think they are required to answer you okay. within. I I could be wrong. I think one twenty days, um, but I'm not sure okay. how long they will actually take. Okay. 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 Good yeah. luck. Right. Good Thank luck. So yeah, I I'm not worried about it. I don't think it's a big deal. Okay. Okay. All right. Okay. Good luck. Yeah. Good luck. Okay. I'm going to lock the conference, guys. That way we can just make sure everybody who's here, we can answer their questions. The conference is now locked. Okay. I've locked the conference. Now, going on to the next question, Rahulji's question I already answered. Uptown guy, I-140 RFE. Denial of the spouse's application for green card and filing H-1B an anticipated timeline for the USAS to deny the I-140 and then the 485. Okay, so what happened here was filed I-140 through an employer and I-485 concurrently in October 2020. Now, moved employers. The problem is the old case got an RFE and the old employer is not going to respond to it. So the question is, 
how soon will we get our 485 denied nobody can answer that question my wife would lo lose her ability to stay in the us company name also changed for her good they are filing another h1b for her that's good she probably will need to get a visa because if she started using her ead are you on the call uh, if you are press star 5 okay um because if she has used ead they cannot normally give her an h1b within the united states they would approve it and then they would have her go outside so i can't tell you the timelines nobody can no point in addressing that question even star 5 if anybody has any follow up question on this press star 5 okay area code 602 a uh, 602 where are you calling from hey yeah i'm calling from tampa florida okay sir go ahead what is your follow up question so, uh, yeah the follow up yeah as i mentioned my wife she is in h4 she came on h4 and she filed her h1b mm -hmm. and uh, her h1b has been processing since last 80 days mm -hmm. yeah so so i just want to yeah because she probably used her ead right she was working all this time right no 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 she's not ead she's just uh, h4 if she was just h4 then they will give her an h1 within the united states no problem okay anything else uh, but uh, the process is taking too long Yeah, well, get her get her H one premiumed. Why don't you get it premiumed? That would help, right? Okay. Good luck. Okay. All right. Bye bye. Thank you. Next question was a frequently question asked question. DV lottery. I'm not answering. Applying for U.S. citizenship for family. Yes. whenever you apply as a family for you your wife your uh, 21 year old children um, you have to file separate applications for all of them there can be no follow up this is just a yes no question after that unless there is a follow up on this press star 5 i don't think there can be a follow up next question number 10 changing jobs after eb2 niw and green card holder leaving the employer for further studies so this is also a difficult question to answer if you get a green card based upon an eb2 niw after 6 months your plan changes and he plans to do something else i think that should be okay but don't make up may think of 6 months as a magic period the most important thing is on the date you got your green card you had no intention to change but something presented itself you are not bound, bonded labor you can change your mind but 6 months is not a magic period the more time it takes after green card for you to change your mind you're better off okay so just keep that in mind um if you go to school what happens in this case again the bottom line is on the date you got the green card you had no intention to leave that's the really important stuff here if you are here on this call press star 5 because i'm not sure i covered all your questions all right any follow up questions star 5 press star 5 okay then next is question number 11 change of address issues when moving from us to canada So in this case, what is happening is, uh, for Snehshiri has a work location in USA and also a permanent resident of Canada. They'll be working from Windsor, Canada, and coming to USA only for a couple of days. Does it still need an H one amendment to include my Windsor home address? I don't think so, but I would be more comfortable if you did an amendment. to reflect that you your employment would require you to come to the us periodically only you won't be working here full time um 
is that really required? In my view, I would be safe rather than sorry. I would definitely add that. And no, you do not need to add Windsor. Windsor is outside the jurisdiction of the United States. USA has no jurisdiction over it. That is not the reason for amendment. The amendment reason is to just point out to the government that you'll be using your H-1B intermittently. That's what I would suggest. Uh, if you have a follow-up question on this, press star 5. So I'm saying do an amendment just to reflect on the record that your employment would be intermittent. You'll be only coming um, just for a couple of days a week or a month. Okay? All right, let's go on to the next question. Again, DV lottery, I'm sorry, I don't know anything about DV lotteries. Can I travel overseas for H-1B stamping without advance parole while 485 is pending? You know, this question is very difficult to answer because the regulations don't appear to be that clear. My, my take on this is simply this. Unless you have a pre-existing H-1B visa, try not to travel. My concern is, first of all, it is not quite clear what happens if you don't have a pre-existing visa. And it is quite clear if for some reason your visa is denied, your 485 will be automatically denied as well. Why? Because you traveled outside without a visa and you don't have an advance parole. So my concern is that this is just an uncertain situation. I don't like it. So I would avoid travel until the advance parole comes. Press star 5 if you have a follow-up question. Press star 5. Okay. Manjiri has a question which is number 13. No, 14. What are the chances of getting an H-1B visa approved if you get denied after RFE or NOID? I applied for H-1B. Oh, so you applied for, your lawyers applied for an H-1B without an LCA. So are you on the phone? Ma'am, Manjari, are you here? Press star 5 if you are. Press star 5. Okay, because I'm not sure this is a quota case or not. Because if it is a quota case, then you have a big problem. But if it is not a quota case, then um, you can always refile the application. Okay. Now, whether you get the H-1 within USA or outside USA is irrelevant because that depends upon the continuity of status. But if you have a quota case, then I think you would have lost the quota place. I think it's difficult. Government won't allow that. LCA is a required part of the application. Star 5, if you have a follow-up question on this. Okay, let's go to any new questions. Anybody has any question, press star 5. Anyone has any question, press star 5. Let's see how many we Only two questions, that's easy. Four questions, okay, that's still quite easy, quite manageable, no problem. Okay, I'll first go, I'll go in the order you logged in. I'll first go to Ohio. Uh, Ohio, please go ahead. I can hear you. Hey, Rajiv. Thanks a lot. Uh, I have a question with regards to the visa stamping. So mm -hmm. I came to the U.S. As on F1 and I changed to H1B. Okay. And one of my siblings is getting married early next year and I wanted to travel, but I can't get the appointment dates. Mm -hmm. What do you think of the options that I have? Uh, try Canada, Mexico. Costa Rica, Bahamas, Jamaica, any of the neighboring countries and just check ahead of time if they are taking third country nationals. You are not required to go to India. You can go to any country. Okay. Uh, even though if it's my first... Uh, it doesn't matter. Problem or it, it doesn't matter. Don't recommend. Okay. I, I don't think it matters. Okay. And... And additionally, like, uh, what are the regulations on work from home? Like, if I'm able to, and if, if I do travel to India and I'm able to wait and work from home from India, is there any rules and regulations on that? Okay. Uh, do a Google search on my name, Rajiv S. Khanna, space, The Economic Times. You'll see uh, my articles there. One of the articles is about working from India while on H-1B. And I'll give you the brief answer, but you can read the whole thing. It's just uh, about four, five hundred, six hundred words. So 
there is i see absolutely no problem with it you don't need an amendment you don't need to do anything you can continue working and continue getting paid as long as you're not working with any um export restricted technologies if this is just normal work you can do it from anywhere including india so yeah no problem anything else no just one other question so uh -huh. if i am changing employers which is uh from and it's cap exempt so mm -hmm. employee a to employee b mm -hmm. they're filing a new visa for me so in a month or so i will be transitioning to that job mm -hmm. so if i do book an appointment uh, i think i would have to give details of my current employment when i book the appointment but then if i change uh what i have to like do i have to make any changes because by the time i, don't I go know. for appointment i would be i, I don't know be, but the details i don't know i think it's in the frequently asked questions that the state department publishes i do not know the answer off the top of my head sorry okay no that's all right thanks thanks so much for your help you're welcome good luck Okay, now I'm going to go to Wisconsin. Uh, Wisconsin, go ahead, please. I can hear you. Namaste, Rajiv ji. I'm Pixie Rahul. What can I do? Rahul ji, I've given you, I've given you enough time. Listen, listen. I've given you enough time. I'm going to give you ten more seconds. Make it really quick. So, like, I understand. why the uscis may have done it but i mean are they really going to take i mean i'm just thinking are they going to take back all of these green cards because i'm not the unique person in this case. well i am not going to comment I mean, on that it's a policy and a litigation issue too too long for me to consider okay i told you what you should do as a practical matter good luck next is california california go ahead please Hi Rajesh ji uh, thanks for taking my question mm -hmm. uh my pd is march 2011 eb2 india which has been current for over a year okay and i have been able to file because that is a previous employer and i'm working for the new employer right now the new employer has filed a form which was denied in july uh, of this year which they have appealed they are also starting the new form process but since we haven't filed the 485 uh my understanding is that i cannot do any more h1 extension when my extension is due next year that's not true so hang on that's not that hang on hang on that's not true when was your form filed okay when was your form filed uh it october of 20 they started the process and hope thing took almost 2 years to get to okay. the united states so you are if your appeal is pending you are entitled to yearly extensions as long as the appeal is pending which is about 3 years got it and let's say since they also started the new form process and before my extension is appeal is denied or if they to start the new process they withdraw the appeal Would I still be eligible to do the H one extension? Well, you will get the one year that you have in hand. It can be timed appropriately, and also uh, you could also um, get one yearly extensions on based upon your old I one forty because you have a damn good reason why four eighty five has not been filed. So ask your lawyers to look into that. You you can you have you will have you have two options right now to extend your H one. Balka appeal is pending. and number 2 the old i14485 cannot be filed and soon you'll have a third reason which is the third perm application pending as soon as it reaches the one year anniversary you are entitled to another extension so all this can be timed i am not worried about your h1b you'll be fine got it then the second prong to my question is uh, i have the opportunity to go and do ed1 uh, i can I'm an executive, and I can uh, get transfer and come back after a year. Mm -hmm. Should I exercise that since I extension is valid until next year December? So if let's say I have valid petition and valid visa after a year, if I just come back on same H one B, would I be eligible to use uh, EB one C? Well, 
there are two advantages to EB1C. First of all, EB1C that makes you eligible for um, getting a very quick green card also makes you eligible for seven years of L1A. So you never have to worry about H1Bs. So there is definitely an advantage, but if you would rather not travel, I think you have enough going here. My only concern is why was the perm denied? What's wrong with the case? Okay. So if there is a an endemic issue with the with with your job situation, you are better off taking the more certain route of EB1C. My my answer would depend upon two two considerations. One, how uncomfortable are you um, in going away for one year? And number two, endemically, what is wrong with the with the labor cert? Why was the perm denied? Okay. Understood. And in this scenario, I have, I'm sorry, I just have a small third question here. Is if I decide to go, can I leave my dependents here on L1 visa? Sorry, no. Sorry, F1 visa. Uh, their own F1? If they have their own F1, definitely. Yes. They are not your dependents, they have their own independent status. They currently are not on F1, they are on H4, but right. I would convert them to F1. Yeah, they can, can stay. Travel yeah, they because, can stay. because then they are not your dependents. The moment they file the F1, uh, they don't have to maintain H4 anymore. They are F1 pending. Go ahead. Go ahead. Yeah, so basically... The reason I wanted to ask that is that that would not create any problem when no. we are ready for filing for it. No, no issue at all. I don't see any problem. Got it. Okay. And so you recommend rather not going to India on ed one c because my H1 is not really in trouble. Mm, given the, I gave the, you the answer. My, my answer would depend upon only yeah. on two considerations. Is it damn uncomfortable to go to India? And two, uh, what is the problem with the labor cert? If the labor cert was denied for a technical reason, I'm not worried. Um, I think you have your H-1B can be uh, properly handled so that there is no gap in the employment, even in the current circumstances. Okay. Got it. And would five mistakes in terms of you know putting wrong technology words in the the form application would be considered technical? Problem? Yeah, that's a that's a typo. That's a typo. So if you are an Oracle Financials guy, and I put down SAP by mistake. That's just a that's just a screw up. Not a big deal. Okay. Got it. Thank you so much, Rajiv. You really appreciate your patience and answering my You're welcome. Good luck. Okay, we have a last question. Let's see. This one is done, and the last one is from Michigan. Uh, Michigan, go ahead, please. Michigan. Go ahead, please. Area code 313. Yeah, go ahead. Go ahead. I can hear you. Uh, sir, sir, I can't hear you. Your, your voice is... Can't hear you. Your voice is breaking up. Nope. Can you... Ma, much better. Is it clear? Much better. Yes, please. Go ahead. Okay, okay. Okay, so I have the H-1B approved petition uh, and I'm on STEM OPT right now. And few weeks ago, I was laid off um, and actually uh, also got a new employer who is uh, now ready to sponsor my uh, transfer petition. So the question is, uh, my previous employer is going to withdraw the petition on October 1. Uh, so once they will withdraw the petition, uh, what status I will be in after, after withdrawing so the what, petition? So what you'll have to do is have your employer file the new employer file for your h1 transfer there are lawyers who say that and some of my colleagues are and they are they have their own point they are saying how can you file a transfer before october 1st and i'm saying we've done it i don't want to talk about the niceties of the law and the logistics and the logic of the law simple reason is because this is a mm -hmm. job in in the future it's still a transfer even though the h1 has not yet kicked in so that's my opinion. We are doing all our cases yeah. like that. We've done them in the past. So if you file the transfer, I think there is a good argument to say that you're an authorized paid off state. But all of that is actually irrelevant. Just file your H-1B premium processing. That way, I think your problems would be resolved. Yeah. With. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
Yeah, so I think you'll be they, fine. They are doing the premium processing. Yeah, but don't work. Is like, you uh, can't. They will withdraw. Yeah, you can't work. Okay, even if they withdraw. Yeah, I, I know, I know, I know. Yeah, I think you are in authorized yeah. period of stay. I think you are fine. You just can't work until the H one B is approved. Go ahead. I just, I just want to understand like uh, what status I will be in after the. I just told the, you that. Uh, Petitions withdrawn. On I, I, I told you that it's called authorized period of stay. Authorized period of stay. Okay. Mm -hmm. And how much? How many days do I have in this uh, stay? Um, you have as long as the H one B is pending. At least that's my reading of the law. Uh, I'm sorry, your voice. I, I said you have as long as the H-1B is pending. That's my reading of the law. But okay. I would okay. definitely file it premium processing because I don't want to take a chance. Yeah, okay. Got okay. it. Understood. Good okay. luck. All right. Thank you so much. You're welcome. Yep, yep. Thank you. All right, folks. Those were all the questions that were on the table. I'll see you guys again in two weeks. Good luck and always good talking to all of you. Take care. Bye-bye.